It's a great honor to be here and to be delivering one of the public lectures in the series. Um, it was also, uh, for me, uh, very important to have done a seminar at the university before this. So as I said, I got to speak to different kinds of audiences there, those who were perhaps students and academics, and I know this is more, okay, uh, this is more uh, an audience of artists and gallerists perhaps. Um, my own background is of course as an academic, but I've been working in the field of the visual arts uh, for, you could say, all my career now. Uh, and I'm now coming close to the end of my time at this institution where I've been for a very long time now. Uh, but hopefully to do many other things that have been held up for so long, <laughs> uh, many other public projects that I have in mind. I want to especially thank my hosts, uh, Rahel and Simon, Valentine too, for really being amazing hosts and who've allowed me to learn so much about this country and this city about which I knew nothing when I came. And the fact that over, I've been here only on, th on Thursday morning and over two and a half days, I think I've got an amazing introduction beginning with the contemporary art scene of Malaysia where I saw the Biennale and I went to his house, which itself is a great introduction to a history of contemporary Southeast Asian art. Then yesterday I had the pleasure of seeing a wonderful exhibition uh, on the history and journey towards Malaysian independence, which, from which again I learned a great deal. So thank you, Natasha, who's somewhere in this audience, for the show and for telling us about it. And also saw the wonderful space of Kakosa and the, the place. And then this morning, I did what I like doing best, which is walking around a city. So again, I was given a wonderful tour of the older part of the city, the colonial part, the older settlements along the river, older religious institutions, mosques, churches. So it was a wonderful, I think we walked for two or three hours and really learned so much. So I do believe that I'm going back hugely enriched which I never imagined that over two days I could have learned so much. So thank you everybody who made this possible. Okay, um, as Valentin said that this, I know that what I'll be talking about today will touch on very, very similar issues that the art worlds are facing across nations. Um, and I don't see this, well I see this as a problem particularly in countries where a culture of religious fundamentalism has been on the rise in new political cultures. Uh, but this talk is not specifically on art and censorship. I'm looking much more at a larger problem of uh, where identities or the institutional spaces that the work of art and often what we associate with worlds of religion occupy. And I'm therefore going to take you through three different kinds of institutions. Uh, it is a written up paper, so I will read. I think time management will be better rather than just speaking. Um, thing. So as was already mentioned, one of my main concerns in the talk today will be to explore a set of contentions and paradoxes that have arisen from a repeated blurring and collapsing of boundaries between the artistic and the religious object across different institutional and public sites in contemporary India. I will be stepping in and out of the circuits of contemporary Indian art to think more broadly about what secures the dispensation of art in the public domain and what are the conditions that empowers or disempowers the worlds of art production. In what ways do artworks acquire or forfeit the authority and immunity that they seek for themselves. And I'm using the term immunity carefully because I think artists and artworks does seek a certain immunity from many other kinds of forces that seem to intrude into those worlds. How do their paths clash, contend, or intersect with parallel careers of religious imagery? 
What are the difficulties as well as the imperatives of maintaining the separateness of these spheres of art and religion? These are some of the central questions I hope to be tracking across three divergent sites of art production and reception. And all the three sites are suggested in uh, the opening slide. In the first part, the lecture revisits the unremitting Hindu right-wing campaign against India's most iconic modern artist, Magbul Fida Hussain. Uh, I'm reluctant to name him a Muslim artist, though ultimately he ends up in that position. So it's interesting that Valentin called him a Muslim artist. He was a secular Indian artist, and he always said, I'm a secular Indian artist. Mm. And Hussein's alleged offense was his painting of Hindu nude goddesses or semi-nude goddesses. So this is Hussein. And uh, we have his dates here. He died in London at the age of 95, uh, could never return. Uh, and these are one of the many images that came under huge controversy. Uh, this is Draupadi in the Game of Dice, a series he did on the Mahabharata. Uh, this campaign forced Hussein into a life of exile and showed up as never before the vulnerabilities of the nation's modern art edifice. If the Hussein affair came to exemplify the siege of culture by the Hindu right, and this is well before the current government came into power, uh, it also opened up a deep instability in the status of the nation's artistic and religious imagery and in the changing representational licenses they enjoy. The second part of the lecture turns to a contrary set of conflations between the sacred and secular dispensation of objects as they move in and out of a vortex of overlapping identities in new fields of display and spectatorship. And this comes out of my work of, on the Durga Pujas of Contemporary Calcutta, where the festival, although it is concerned with the worship of Goddess Durga, has effectively turned into a space of public installation, spectatorship, and a world of exhibition and display. And that has been my take, that it happens in the name of the goddess, but it is actually becomes a cultural festival and a public art event in the city. So this is an example of one of the kinds of street installations uh, down a very narrow lane leading to the main pavilion where the goddesses hold. So what my talk takes up then is the striking reconfiguration of Durga icons as works of art in the streets of Calcutta during the city's annual Durga Puja extravaganza to think about the porous boundaries that allowed the religious and the artistic the liberty to trespass into and inhabit each other's domains. So this is an interesting example. Shanatan Dinda is one of the people working in the field who's done very experimental icons. Uh, this is one typically where a lot of folk art forms are brought into play in the imaging. So it's a clay idol which is given the look of a bronze bastar sculpture. At the same time, my work also addresses the ambivalences that lie embedded in the claims of art and artist in the space, ephemeral space of mass festivity. So this is some of the things I also look carefully at, that art is not a condition that one takes for granted or even the identity. The final part of the lecture returns to the sphere of contemporary art practice to profile a different order of license and parody in the works, and here I take the case of a contemporary artist of my generation, a Bangalore and Delhi-based artist called N. Pushpamala, that calls into question the sanctity and self-importance of both the religious and artistic icons of the nation. I'll be returning to analyzing this image. Through each of these instances, my main concern is to ask, how secure is the habitus of art what kinds of rights over iconographies can it nurture? And here by iconographies, I wish to push it from the domain of the religious into the larger cultural field. And what degree of privilege and protection can art or the designation of art confer on the images and their makers? 
In moving from the art of M.F. Hussain to that of Calcutta's Durga Pujas and on to the new genres of photo performance of Pushpamala, an on-running concern will be with this, as I've said, the vexed interface of the artistic and the religious across these domains. With the public and popular fields of location of these varied bodies of art practice and the kinds of iconographic transgressions that these enable or foreclose. The first section is called The Nudes That Offend, Looking Back on the Hussein Affair. In a landmark judgment in September 2008, the Supreme Court of India had declared with authority and conviction that Hussein's paintings, and there are several that came under scanner, under censorship because of criminal cases that were lodged against him, that they came to a conclusion, very interesting statement was that they are works of art. Thus putting a seal on the earlier May ruling of the Delhi High Court that had already acquitted the artist of several criminal charges that had been pending against him for several years. So from 1996 till 2008, there were several criminal charges that were brought against Hussein. Uh, and the Supreme Court verdict was meant to clear the artist finally of these charges. Over 12 years, that is from 1996, the petitions had kept piling from different parts of the country for the criminal prosecution of the artist on the grounds of, within quotes, obscenity, offense to Hindu religious sensibilities, and the generation of ill will among communities on religious grounds. The target of outrage was initially this line drawing of a new Saraswati that was actually not in the public domain at all, that was actually pulled out and suddenly made a huge issue around it. So the big question had been raised that if this was an incitement to public uh, kind of communal ill feeling, then those who had pulled it into the public domain was perhaps as responsible as the artist because this work strangely was not in the public domain. It was pulled out and placed there. Over the decade, the target of outrage shifted from this line drawing to several other paintings of Hussein's goddesses uh, to this particular image, which is not one of Hussein's best, but this unclothed female figuration of a map of India that Hussein actually had not named Bharat Mata because he was careful enough not to name it that. But that was pulled out of a charity auction house in London in 2006. In a two-part representation of the nation as a map, uh, the first painted in 1997 on the occasion of 50 years of India's independence, the second in 2005, the artist inventively drew on what Sumati Ramaswamy has termed the national longing for cartographic form, where each nation longs for maps, but also for maps to become anthropomorphic and where maps take on an embodied form. In the first, uh, the motherlanders map carries all the official national symbols and is draped in the colors of the national flag. Though the saffron is not quite prominent, so it he did use white saffron and green. Uh, what's interesting in typical Hussein style, he brings in his horses, his skyscrapers, but an interesting figure of a receding Gandhi. You know, this is no longer the India of Gandhi. So Gandhi's busy with his famous Dandi march departing from the scene. In the second, Hussein pointedly denudes the map, replaces the tricolor with the screaming red of her body, and inscribes her facial features with visible anguish. Avowedly painted in a latter-day response to the Gujarat communal carnage in the country of 2002, Hussein uses nudity here as a trope of a scarred and ravaged motherland. That such an artistic move came to be targeted as anti-national and immoral by his detractors stemmed from a now all too familiar trajectory of deliberate non-comprehension and misrecognition, an ascription of malintention around his imagery. As alleged in one of the many anti-Hussein websites that began to circulate in cyberspace, I quote, 
This lecherous Muslim artist has already disrobed with impunity many of the Hindu gods and goddesses, and now he dares to disrobe even our beloved Bharat Mata. As the campaign against the artist snowballed from a local to a global, uh, to as, sorry, as the campaign against the artist snowballed from a local and national to a global arena, the cyberspace became the main site for the proliferation and circulation of anti Hussein propaganda. And you know, for a long time now, we know how it's the world of social media now which operates often as this domain where uh, so many attacks are launched. And it was the, really this world uh, where it was a global political community of Hindus who were being mobilized in righteous defense of the nation and its iconographies. So in this cover of this 206 issue of Jansang Today, which is uh, one of the mouthpieces of the BJP, um, we see one such divine icon of the offended nation, the ever vengeful Kali wreaking her wrath on the erring artist and his canvas. Finally, in September 2008, there came a sense of relief among many of us, many of the art community, intellectual community, standing in solidarity with Hussein, that the force of law had intervened in the name of art to protect the artist and prove his innocence. But let me here interrogate this invocation by art by the highest judicial authority of the nation to ask what weight and authority it could command over its subjects of address. After all, it was always known that what Hussein did was to produce works of art. So what was at stake in renaming it that this is art and therefore has its licenses and privileges? What protection did the legal judgment confer on the artist and his images, or we may ask on the broader domain of contemporary art practices? Cleared of charges by the court, though not all of them, the artist still had to live out the last years of his life in enforced exile in Dubai, reaching out to the world, still traveling to London and New York with admirable energy, and Hussein's energy was truly admirable into his 80s and 90s, but holding back his return to his homeland for the grave risk disposed to his person, property, and paintings, because his flat had been vandalized, galleries where his work was shown had been kind of raided and works had been pulled down. In August 2008, well after the Delhi High Court passed its judgment, it is interesting that the biggest art fair in the capital city of Delhi, the three-day mega Indian art summit, chose to play it safe by not showing any works of Hussein, pointedly excluding the very person who's first brought glamour and big money into contemporary Indian art. In what became a predictable silent, uh, cycle of violence, the protest exhibition organized by the activist organization called Sehmat, uh, Safdar Hashmi Memorial Trust, uh, it's been a uh, kind of left activist organization. They campaigned against the destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya, and they took up Hussein's cause with great vigor. So in protest, they set up a parallel exhibition of Hussein's photographs, some of his paintings, and a screening of uh, Hussein's film. And that show was vandalized, and this has now become a predictable cycle. And ultimately, the entire show had to be relocated within the most secure precincts of the Jamia Millia Islamia University, where a contemporary art gallery was set up in 2008, symbolically named after Hussein. So with each of these moves, we find M.F. Hussein pitched more and more into the identity of a Muslim artist. His secular non-denominational identity trampled over not just by forces that labeled him an anti-Hindu painter, but, a and, but also by institutions like the Jamia Millia University that made him the new cause of secular Islam. The matter was compounded by Hussein's decision to opt for Qatar citizenship that was offered to him in 2010, when he realized that it was very difficult for him ever to return to India. A decision that became a further cause of great remorse in India's artistic circles. And I'm showing you this, you cannot read it, but this is from the journal, Art Journal, where there's a lament which says, M.F. Hussein was Indian, have we made him a foreigner? 
And this was echoed in an obituary when Hussein died, which said, the Qatari is dead, long live the Indian. So there was a lot of remorse about Hussein giving up his Indian citizenship and becoming a Qatar citizen. The Hussein affair brought to the fore critical array of formulations and debates on the ways in which his art had most powerfully represented the secular face of modern Indian art. From the 1950s into the 70s, M. F. Hussain ex exemplified more than any other artist the public and popular face of modern Indian art. And you know, among the Bombay progressives, many of whom left the country, like Raza, like F. N. Souza, Hussain stayed on. So Hussein very much became then almost, you could say, an official figure of the national uh, modern artist in post-independence India. So what we see here is one of his early best-known works from the time he worked closely within the progressive movement in the immediately post-independence years. We have the passage uh, then, and I'm going to jump through a lot of it, to his to a slightly later Hussein when he begins to do his trademark horses, faceless icons of Mother Teresa, Indira Gandhi, and also makes his parallel incursions into genres of poster imagery. So this is Hussein now negotiating worlds of both popular, more commercial art, as well as you know, occupying the space of the nation's iconic modern artist. Hussein projected most powerfully the secular credentials of modern Indian art through his claims on the rich inheritance of religious and mythic iconographies of the nation. So Hussein always said that he could claim all of India as his own, from India's ancient sculpture to her vast body of religious iconographies was his. And he saw this as his cultural inheritance as an Indian artist. But these critical markings of the artist and secular were what came under constant threat of erasure in the unceasing vendetta against him that unfolded from the 1990s. One of my main points is to show how the domain of art, with its avowed freedoms and immunities, turned out to be the most unstable and inhospitable habitus for an artist like him. What was once the most secure and powerful edifice of the secular nation its modern art establishment, was left contending with a deep set of fissures in its foundation. As has been widely discussed, and of course, this has been a widely written about, and um, there's a wonderful book in which an essay of mine comes, but edited by Somati Ramaswamy, called Barefoot Across the Nation, M. F. Hussain and the Idea of India, and where I think he got across lots and lots of people to write about Hussein. And the book came out just on the eve of Hussein's death. We wished to release it in India, but Hussein did not want to come to India. Uh, so it was not possible, but he saw it uh, in his lifetime. So it has been widely discussed that it was precisely Hussein's celebrity st stature. You know, this famous barefoot artist, he made a trademark of being barefoot, uh, just like Gandhi made it his style to wear the loin cloth. So Hussein decided he would go barefoot. But it became part of a celebrity stature. His singular fame and success, compounded by the accident of his religion, that made Hussein the most vulnerable to the cultural bigotry of the country's Hindu right wing during this period. Why the attack on Hussein, the privileges of the entire world of modern art were being called into question within a new politicized public domain that staked its own control of artistic representations. This is what forced many of us to confront the fragilities and inadequacies of the claims of the secular in what has been termed a post-secular configuration of the nation. Looking out from the shutters of this controversy, I'd like to pose the problems of contemporary art and national life along three broad lines of concern. The first relates to the much discussed theme of the rights and privileges of art. Okay. Please tell me if I'm spilling over time, but I hope I can hold your attention for most of the talk. Mm. 
So the first relates, as I said, to this rather vexed theme of what constitutes the rights and privileges of art. Now, without slipping into what is seen to be a slightly vexed theme of artistic freedom, because they always say artistic freedom comes with responsibility. So the question to ask is, how do we argue a case for the rightful place of nudity in Indian art history and position the female nude, divine and non-divine as one of the most consecrated objects of modern and modernist art in India as much in the West. Okay, so the nude remains this highly consecrated object uh, of art. To what extent and with what inbuilt safeguards and reservations can contemporary Indian art hold on to its options of not just painting the nude, but equally of transgression and irreverence? We know that art has the right to be irreverent, but to what extent can the artist hold on to that without endangering the very terms of its existence? And how would one constitute a very different sense of proprietor artistic proprietorship over cultures and iconographies, which is one of the critical needs of the time. What follows, so this is the first set of concerns. What follows are a second set of concerns about the secular status of art and the categorical distinction that needs to be reintroduced between the work of art and the religious icon in the public sphere. In this crisis, it became crucial to renegotiate the terms and conditions in which art embodies the secular to be able to set apart the distinctiveness of its practices from those of contemporary religion. Can there be any sound legal grounds for the charge of blasphemy, a strictly religious crime of treason against God in these secular liberal worlds of art practice? And is there any obvious way in which an artistic representation circulating within the spaces of art can hurt the sentiments of a collective community of worshipers? These questions have direct connotations for the kinds of protection and regulation that can be legitimately claimed for the sacred objects of art vis-a-vis -vis the sacred objects of religious usage. And both are sacred, we know. So both have their own sacrosanct status and need the protection. Both in terms of law and in terms of social and moral norms, one would have to argue for two radically separate notions of protection that could sustain the sanctity and inviolability of the work of art as much as that of the religious object. The third set of issues touch on something that actually needs much more work on, on the vital question of publics and public spheres that exist for contemporary art practices in India. And I hope if there's time to return to it at the end of the lecture, but otherwise to at least open it up for discussion. What these attacks on art have continuously highlighted is the lack of visual and artistic literacy in the general public domain. A lack that manifests itself not just in the domains of mass culture, but across a large body of elite and middle class opinion, which remain highly divided on this issue of the alleged licenses and offenses of the images of contemporary Indian art. Within the exclusive circuits of art galleries and curated exhibitions, what also circulates is a new discourse about appropriate and inappropriate publics, about who may be entitled to comprehend and participate in today's global vocabularies of radical and interventionist art, and who remain outside it. In this context, it becomes crucial to ask how in-house is the art and intellectual community that is crying itself hoarse about its violated autonomy? What kinds of bridges can be built between this community and the many other worlds of art production and other less informed worlds of opinion and prejudice that lie outside its bounds. So building that bridge is essential. Let us recall in this context the elaborate attempt made by defenders of Hussein of a public education in Indian art history and religious iconography through an invocation of India's long artistic tradition of the female nude highlighting the ritual validity of nudity in Indian sculptural iconography, pointing to the innumerable instances of unclothed female figures, divine and semi-divine in Indian sculpture and architecture, some of which I'm showing here, to prove the point that in no way had Hussein transgressed the bounds of what was permissible in art and religion 
within Indian iconography. The very image of contention, Hussein's nude Saraswati, was shown to have its lineage in several sculptures on the walls of 11th and 12th century Hoysala temples, where the torso of the goddess in, is invariably bare and only her lower parts covered with ornaments. The artist himself participated actively in this mode of self-legitimization. In his interviews of that period, Hussein went to lengths to show how heavily his vocabulary had been informed by past traditions of Indian sculpture, and how, as a quintessential Indian, he had internalized the spirit of Hindu myths and icons. Yet these counter stances, and there was a long and prolonged battle fought, did little to either change public perception or stem the tide of the assaults. This has been the sobering lesson and realization of the long years over which the campaign was waged in support of Hussein. The celebration of the sexual feminine imagery of ancient Indian art, especially the erotic temple sculptures of a site like Khajuraho, could go hand in hand with the continued polemics and pogrom against Hussein's nudes in this another public sphere. So it's interesting that we were celebrating the thousand years of the Khajuraho temples in the same years that the battle was being waged against Hussein's art. And Hussein himself did a lot of sketches from Khajuraho. But so the big question is what is it that makes one legitimate and the other non acceptable? What was difficult in all this was shifting the lines of defense from the past traditions of Indian art and religious iconographies to the vocabularies of modernist and postmodernist art in India. Throughout these debates with both artists and their defenders, one is struck by the conspicuous elision of the terms on which modern Indian art of the post-independence years consciously break, broke with its national past and embraced in diverse ways the styles and motifs of Western modernist art. So we have the paradox of some of the most distinctive iconographies of Indian modernist art continuously being justified in terms of and positioned within an unbroken line of ancient sculptural traditions. The moot point that needs to be underlined is the way what was once a secure and fortified sphere of the modern had become an increasingly treacherous ground for Hussein, as also for the many artists who consistently raised their voices in his support. To hold on to the arrogance and prerogatives of modern art would have not only been a commendable stance in this political environment of hostility, but it would have also brought many other artists under the same attack. To have cited the cases of innumerable other lascivious modernist nudes in the works of Hussein's contemporaries, or to have argued that Hindu artists, and most of them would have not taken to the term Hindu artists, say like A.G. Subramaniam or Gogi Sarojpal, that they have taken as much liberty and has unabashedly unclothed their goddesses and have often treated them with the same playful irreverence would have exposed them all perhaps to the same dangers and violations. Pushed against the wall, artists like Hussein and many others around him had to interestingly turn their backs on their modernity and steer clear of publicly acknowledging their daring and layering in laying bare bodies and sexualities or in experimenting with motives of gods and goddesses. How far Hussein's iconographies can be read as transgressive or prevalent representative norms, representational norms, is of course an endless subject of debate. Faceless and post alike, his figures resist the gaze while their flattened bodies, contours, deflect the erotic into abstracted motive. So many people have actually said that, uh, you know, question the extent to which we can even talk of the erotic in Hussein's art. Uh, in rounding off this discussion on, Hussein, on the Hussein affair, I'd like to pose the problem of transgression on a different register by pushing it away from the content of Hussein's images onto the ontological status of his work in the public domain. What was being violated all through this controversy was not only the authority of the work of art, 
but also the all important boundaries between art and non-art. Hussein's paintings were being dragged out of their location within an exclusive sphere of modern art practices to answer charges in a public political domain to which they never belonged. There are generic distinctions to be made between the visualization of goddesses in modern Indian art, like in Hussein's paintings, and those in popular print productions and calendar art. And I show this as a, a common distinction. Uh, the image on the right is by a well-known artist called Raja Ravi Varma. Uh, so it actually hangs in an art gallery, but it became part of a circulating popular lithographs. And that, Ravi, Ravi Varma's art became calendar art and worshipped icons in a way that Hussein's art never would. So the categorical distinction, though, was not something that was in place. While he worked with a series of popular reference culled specially from film posters and hoardings, Hussein's images have also unsettled these idioms in a way that resists their easy reception by consumers of popular culture. The point to reiterate is that a work of modern art has seldom been able to comfortably inhabit this unbounded domain of the popular. The situation is particularly paradoxical if we were to juxtapose the lascivious and seductive nudes of some of Ravi Varma's mythological paintings that moved from galleries and began to circulate as mass-produced lithographs. If we were to juxtapose this with the flattened, de-eroticized de -eroticized figures of M. F. Hussein. More than any other contemporary artist, Hussein consciously quoted the popular obsessively drawing on the fantasies and indulgences of Bollywood cinema, as we see here in his famous series of paintings dedicated to Madhuri Dikshit, the great Indian actress, where Madhuri appears as Radha in a series he does. Okay. Hussein also sprayed his imprint across prints, posters, tin cans, and designer drapes to produce a cottage industry of his own images in the market. So I one could talk of him as a new kind of Ravi Varma of different times who was putting his art out into the public domain. Yet in all these citations and interventions, Hussein would never have wished to have dissolved the divide that kept his artistic oeuvre securely apart from many other genres of mass production. He would never have wanted to give up the vantage position of the secular modern from which he operated. But the popular public sphere claimed him in a way he could never have bargained for. It eroded his high ground of autonomy and immunity, leaving him and his art dangerously vulnerable before a hateful public. Okay, I'm gonna now move on in a fairly quick jump to the next section, uh, which where I bring in my work on Durga Puja. And I call it Goddesses That Have Become Art, notes from the Durga Pujas of contemporary Calcutta. This figure is an enlarged head where Durga appears only as a face. It's done in papier-mâché and we have many such. So interestingly, you have a little idol which is actually worshipped and will be immersed. These are done primarily for display. Okay. If the campaign against MF Hussain, uh, and of course there have been many, many such attacks on artists, on writers. So before Hussain, there was Salman Rushdie whose book was banned and their academics like Wendy Doniger, whose works have come under attack. So in a way, a f it opened the floodgates of a series of attacks on artists and intellectuals. If this campaign against Hussein allowed the new claims of the religious to invade the secularized domain of modern art and academia, the field of Durga Puja celebrations in Calcutta, in contemporary Calcutta, is marked by a pointedly opposite trend the conspicuous secularization of a religious festival and its metamorphosis into a public exhibitionary event. So this is a typical example of crowds where an artist decided to paint the house fronts of a full neighborhood to make the entire neighborhood part of an installation within which Durga, the worship or the celebrations were taking place. During the days and nights of the festival, the entire topography of the city undergoes a magical transfiguration, with the streets taken over by myriad shapes and forms of pandals, which are temporary pavilions that are erected to house images of the goddess. These pandals serve primarily as exhibition sites,
taking on spectacular forms of architectural replicas of forts, palaces, pagodas. So I'm just going to run through some of them. But I wanted everybody to get a sense of a crowd event, that there are huge crowds, touring crowds, that move through the city, through these make-believe, where these make-believe architecture come up within the space of the city. So you can see standard housing behind it inside a Rajasthani fort and palace. So yes, so, they, so these pavilions range from different kinds of architectural replicas to folk art villages like this, uh, which bring folk artists on board to create these craft villages. And, okay, folk art village, okay. For several years now, a defining feature of such spectacles had been a, has been a global imaginary and an unfettered local license to copy, reassemble, and reinvent any monument or site that catches the fancy of the organizing clubs, producers, and publics. So these clubs are what organizes these events. From the art of the ancient Incas, to distant African villages, uh, from a remake of the Sanchi Stupa to the Opera House of Paris, all of India and the world are laid open for free tours to the people of the city during the week of the festival. From the genre of loosely conceived fairground remakes, these puja pavilions have come to take on the form of more laboriously researched and reconstructed theme parks for instance, of different states of India. So this, for instance, was a theme park of the state of Karnataka. And sometimes they genuinely take on the form of public art installations. So this was an interesting one, where the yellow and black taxi, which is increasingly becoming an extinct item in all cities with the coming of Olas and Ubers, where they took old taxi parts and they made a public art installation. And uh, I love the one with the horns. The horns is the buffalo demon. So the taxi was given even the horns to make it part of it. Yet notwithstanding such transformations, the Durga Puja pavilions, I'm arguing, do not brook any easy equations with the worlds of contemporary modern art. There can be no easy incorporation also of the denomination of the secular into a mass festival where the goddess remains the central effective protagonist. If the Durga Pujas have over the years become inadequately religious, and this is of course a great lament of the disappearing religiosity and the increasing commercialization of the event, the festival has also remained inadequately secular. And this is an argument that I'm trying to play with. What sharply spells out this incommensurability for instance, is the way the experience of touring the exhibitionary fields of the puja still has no other name in local parlance except Thakur Dekha, which means you go around seeing the gods. Uh, even though this practice of spectatorship has little that is religious about it and stands quite distinct from, say, the practices of pilgrimage tourism. Such contradictions are never resolved, but only accentuated by the new language of publicities, by the thick inflections of devotion and sentiment which, which today's print television and advertising media packages the Durga Pujas and produces around it a discourse of a communitarian festival that is meant to transcend the barriers of region, creed, and class, and bring together families and communities. And I'll just show you two contemporary Durga Puja ads. I've used a lot of advertisements in my book. This is an interesting one of a plywood company which talks about a joint family remaining intact because we know that Durga comes with her family under a overarching arch. And here we have children playing out all the characters and the term says, let the joint family remain united. Okay. Or say this, which shows a turban Sikh taking part in the religious, in the immersion procession, taking the goddess out, where again I've translated what is involved. Uh, so it is my contention that the festival has, over a long period of time, opened up a domain of social affect and transaction, where the normative institutional categories of the religious and the secular can neither fall comfortably in place, nor be set off in opposition to each other. The transforming nature of this public field can be seen 
to both preserve and erase the markings of the ritual location within the body of the urban festival, where the ambience of worship is never absent, but is also continuously being deflected into one of display and spectacle. So here is a classic instance of a innovative Durga, but where worship continues even as spectatorship uh, there. I'd like to focus specifically on the way in which the field of festivity has come to acquire a special artistic character in recent times, generating its own thick discourse of art production and reception. The recent career of a particular genre of production, which is locally termed the art or theme puja, these are all examples of that, provided me a main lead for tracking the artistic profile of the festival. It introduced us to this novel type of creative personnel who have captured the field of Durga Puja designing. So the idea of the Durga Puja designer is a completely new category. Who has emerged side by side with the communities of hereditary idol makers or the suburban firm of pavilion decorators who had long dominated the field. Durga Puja now attracts growing numbers of artists and designers ranging from the successful art college trained professional the film and television set designers, to local amateurs, to a type of people who stand ambivalently strung between the identities of artist and artisan. The change in creative personnel brought a distinct shift in the forms and formats of production. Under this new dispensation, the puja in its entirety, the image, the pavilion, the surrounding tableau, the colors, the decoration, even themed music, is conceived of and laid out as an integrated theme by an individual artist and his team, usually with the help of a hereditary idol maker, artisanal labor who create the, the basic structure of the pavilion, and often with rural craft persons who are brought from near and far to work on these projects. So it's an interesting blending of different kinds of artistic labor. Show you an example of this kind of an integrated pavilion called a theme puja. A lot of this is work in fiber and thermocol, so entirely with ephemeral material to be dismantled. And this is a special Durga by an idol maker who's from a hereditary family, but is himself art school trained, who produces an image to suit the theme of the pavilion. So Durga comes here like the image of Shiva, Shiva Standava. Now, through the careers of this new outcrop of puja designers and their theme productions, my work traces the emergence of a particular aesthetics of what I call vernacular modernism and a new genre of festival art that negotiates the different resources ranging from traditional in Indian temple architecture. So here's an example of an Orissa temple laboriously recreated in the middle of a South Calcutta neighborhood. So they're using the idioms of temple architecture to, as I said, rich resource is tribal and folk art forms, uh, as this example shows, to the language of contemporary installation art. Here was a huge radial sun made with bamboo uh, for a Durga Puja installation. Okay. Uh, I also show how in keeping with these new tableaus, the image of the goddess and her entourage take on newer and newer forms, each icon competing with its rivals as an object for viewing and photography. So you see all the, the, the media there, and the goddess here looks like a Pahari painting in keeping with the Rajasthani complex that, that grew around her accompanied by concept notes and credit lines to the production team and the lead designer, the ambience of these puja productions come to increasingly compete with that of public art exhibitions. So the pujas are routinely opened by invited celebrities and judges. They are judges, they are competitions for the best pujas, the best event, designed by art school trained artists or set design professionals organized often by professional event managers, and drawn into competition for a growing number of awards for excellence of production. So these kinds of list of awards which are being advertised 
or this kind of pavilion which shows the awards won by a puja. Uh, the 25 years was the paint company called Asian Paints, and they were giving these special awards for its 25 years. So this kind of commercial signage and awards and trophies are today part of the festival topography. At the same time, there's a public, popular, and ephemeral dimension to this field of production that clearly sets it apart from the enclaves of modern art and its circuits of art galleries, exhibitions, catalogues, critics, and collectors. So one of the most important figures missing here is the critic. Durga Pujas have no critic. They have no curators. Uh, so uh, I tried my best to do curated walks through the event, but these are figures that are missing from this world. So for all its endeavors to innovate, experiment, and inculcate new artistic tastes in the spectator, all Durga Puja tableaus must take their place within an unenclosed and unbounded public domain, and must struggle to find popular approbation alongside connoisseurial attention. And this is something that many said, that we have to appeal to the ordinary people. It's not enough just to appeal to a small discerning crowd. The locations being the open street and roadside parks, all panel structures, however elaborate, must come down at the end of the festival week. Just as every Durga clay idol, however beautiful, must be ritually immersed at the end of the puja. The new publicities, so I look at some of the remnants that remain as the installations are removed. Um, the new publicities that surround this domain of festival art, like the new artistic identities that are staked around it, are as fleeting and as seasonal as the event itself. Artistic aspirations here have to battle then with two trajectories that have become germane to the festival phenomenon. The trajectories of excess and of ephemerality. The bane of excess is today manifest not only at the visual level of advertising and sponsorship, there's so much clutter of advertisements and banners that almost threatens to smother the work on view, but also at the level of overproduction and inundation of the form of theme puja to a point of saturation. So when I began, there were a handful of artists doing the work. Now there's so many that it's, it's lost its distinction. How do stakes of originality and authorship that are so essential to the notion of art survive in such spheres? What explains the huge investment in funds and the intensity of labor, time, and creative energy that are invested in art productions which are intended to last only the week or 10 days of the festival? Whereas the older seasonal practices of idol and pandal making had the logic of destruction, dismantling, and recycling of material built into the logic of the trades, some of the newer genres of Durga Puja art are left struggling to come to their terms with their ephemeral life as public tableau and post-festival redundancy as collectible or preservable artwork. So here's an example of an artist who actually worked with mahogany was promised that the work would get collected and has finally been collected, but it lay for a long time in waiting for somebody to buy it and have it installed. Nothing underlines more sharply this liminal life of Durga Puja art than the career graphs of a few select Puja designers who have most successfully used this field of work as a creative platform to make their mark as artists in their own right pulling themselves over the thin arc that took them from the socially deprived backgrounds and artisanal skills into art college training and a professional artistic vocation. This breed of artist designers have provided the contemporary festival with its richest repertoire of art productions, experimental pavilions, and signature style goddesses. And I'll show you just run through the examples of one of the artists I worked on, the Tibetan bronze goddess is his. So he works with a lot of traditional sculptural form. This could be a Pala period sculpture, and clearly an image in worship. Uh, to others, where he's worked with Durga as this rising thing, where the family comes at the bottom. He even did a tribute to M.F. Hussain um, in one of his, after the Hussain's death, and he works with fiberglass and he signs his Durga images now. So again, authorship is now taken on a new form. Within today's 
mixed and increasingly crowded milieu of theme pujas, we could think of these select productions as most effectively testing the claims of art in a domain where it is in continuous risk of dissembling and evaporating. Yet the more the cast grows, the more awards there are for the asking, and the more thickly theme puja productions proliferate all part of the city, the more difficult it becomes to hold on to markers of artistic pedigree. Distinctions become hard to unearth and even harder to hold on to. There's a critical distinction that the field continuously confronts us with. Between the phenomenal artistry of design, conception, skills, and workmanship that pervades the sphere, and the different institutional and ideological authority of artworks that seem to somehow elude it. There are many in art circles who are loath to grant any of these productions the name of installation art. Designations which they rightly say have come out of an altogether different history of avant-garde art practice. A key paradox I explore here is the aspiration of some of Puja's designers to take on the idioms and materials of installation art in an arena where none of the other attendant parameters of curating, criticism, and reception can ever be in place. They bid to establish a structure of authorial prerogative and custody over their own festival production also runs into sticky grounds, as do their ambitions of transforming their Durga imagery into works of art and ensuring their post-festival preservation in private or public spaces of display. Ownership and authorship over these productions constantly spill outside the hold of the designer to the organizing clubs who freely sell and dispense with these after the week of the pujas are over to meet their costs. This produces a series of other ambivalences in their claims to be art. The importance of asserting and holding on to the identity of artists in this field of work escalates precisely in proportion to the difficulties of doing so. The designation of art and the prestige and acclaim that it generates is never a secure index in this creative domain. Rather, it is one that needs to be carefully negotiated within a vortex of shifting styles and production processes, and given its new markings within a register of popular taste. All transitions in this sphere remain incomplete, just as each puja production, however ambitious, is left with no other name in local pallans but a pandal. They're all called pandals, even though they take on multiple forms. In the same way in which each Durga image, however innovative in its iconography, is left grappling to transcend its status as an idol and become a work of art. The term thakur, or deity, is one that continuously queers the grounds on which the religious festival contends with its life as a burgeoning exhibitionary and art event. So it is that a newly converted warehouse gallery tucked away deep within the grounds of the main lakes in the city. I've talked about the lakes. It's a big artificial lake. Uh, here a gallery was set up into which came a small selection of Durga Puja pavilion decor and a small selection of art Durgas from the seasons of 2012 and 13. But the fact that it is referred to locals of the area with wonder and bemusement as the Thakur Der Gallery, which means a gallery of the gods, actually shows the problem involved. Stored and displayed here are some of the recent art brand Durga images brought in by award-winning and politically backed puja clubs across the city. But most telling has been the complete absence of any professional curatorial involvement. They were just came and just set up and sometimes terrible colors put up all around them. So you can see the butterfly image had a different ambience and now it seems to have lost that. Okay. So, and also there's been a complete lack of publicity surrounding the forming of what we may think of of the city's first gallery of collectible Durga Puja art. Few in the city's art circuits know of it or have cared to know about its existence and future, and even fewer have ever visited it. Each of these factors underscores the incommensurability of the art of the festival with the larger institutionalized spaces of art practices and viewing, and keeps scuttling the potentials of a post-festival artistic afterlife of these objects. Do I have time to go through my third section? 
Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. I, I, it's the shortest section. It's called The Artist as Goddess, The Impersonations of Pushpamala. To highlight these ambivalences that surround Durga Puja art and artists is to mark out once again the separateness from the contiguous sphere of contemporary art, where the critical distinction, lines of distinction between the religious and the art object still fall powerfully in place. In contrast to the field of the pujas, the distinction here needs constantly to be reaffirmed and re resurrected to stake claims on a special order of artistic privilege vis-a-vis -vis sacred icons and to mark out a select public as targets of address. The question of publics, the artistic literacy and initiation in certain languages of representation is centrally at stake. If in the unbounded space of mass viewing, the art of the pujas can never escape the demands of popular appeal and approbation and must coexist with a host of more man mundane and standardized productions. The modern artwork, on the contrary, thrives within its own circles of exclusion and sets its own clear bounds on the publics it cultivates and the connoisseur community to which it belongs. In this part, final part, I'm going to Consider some of the works of the artist Pushpamala, which pulls apart and unsettles the authority of both the religious and the artistic icon. Okay. Now, Hussein was a great performer of art. He would stand and perform his paintings on site. So Hussein came to be known as this long before performance art came into being as a performing artist who would continuously perform his art to large publics. Now from a wholly different position, Pushpamala comes into the scene with her novel brand of what she calls photo performances and masquerades that she began to work on from the mid 1990s. In these productions, her art too has reveled in the citations of popular photographs, film stills, cinema sequences, and God pictures like we see here, and has played with similar elements of excess and repetition. And it is through an elaborate process of play acting and performance with props, sets, and costumes, so none of this is digitally done. There actually is a backdrop painted. She actually has herself photographed like a performance for each of these. Okay. And so it is through this elaborate process that she engages with the complex history of image making and iconography in modern Indian art and cinema. So this is a whole series she did called Phantom Lady uh, of Kismet from taking on the, the figure of the vamp in Hindi cinema. Trained in the country's premier art college in Baroda during the 1980s, Pushpamala moved from her earlier work in figurative sculpture to this new genre of work with photographs, where she has obsessively imaged herself in different costumes, roles, and stage settings drawn from the history of Indian art, photography, and popular cinema. In the first of these photo performance series, uh, which was called Phantom Lady, she keeps appearing as a vamp-like or masked phantom lady, playing out different seduction scenes and stunt roles in lavish indoor and outdoor sets in a direct takeoff from the genre of popular Bollywood gangster movies. In another photograph series titled Navarasa, Pushpamala delves into the format of the posed and dramatically lit studio photograph to interpolate the classical aesthetics of rasas, moods, and the iconography of naikas as embodiments of this rasas. Presenting herself, for instance, as a modern day Draupadi about to be disrobed in an enactment of Bibhatsa rasa or a mood of horror or revulsion. The citations and performances get more and more dense and researched in a subsequent series, which is really a very brilliant series, which she titles Native Women of South India, in which the artist taking on from the colonial ethnography, in which the artist inserts her own self into different kinds of artistic, ethnographic, and religious feminine imagery, dressing herself up sometimes as a Toda woman of colonial anthropological photographs, sometimes juxtaposing you know, the lamprey grid against which tribals were measured and heads, juxtaposing these kind of anthropological photographs with 
dressing up as a village woman from a painting by Raja Ravi Verma. So she actually takes the paintings of Ravi Verma and plays with that. Sometimes she appears as the figure of a yogini, a female ascetic from a 17th century Deccani miniature painting. So there's immense work she does in doing the props and costumes. So that's part of the work she does. Or as the votive Mary of the South Indian church of Velankini. There seems to be no end to these narcissistic impersonations of Pushpamala as she relentlessly pushes her own costume photographed image into a myriad inheritance of artistic, cinematic, and religious iconographies. There's a mischievous iconoclastic impulse running through this entire project where Pushpamala lays bare the entire imaging and production processes of the painter's atelier, the photographer's studio, or the cinema technician's sets that are naturalized in the presentation of the finished image, and where she parodies the self-importance of these iconic images by mimicking the way they pose within pictures or look out at us. As I said before, she makes it a point not to re resort to digital insertions and manipulations in the construction of her images, opting instead for the laborious process of setting up painted backdrops, props, and sets, and putting herself into costumes and ornaments, and then having the entire tableau photograph. And it is the fetishized feminine image that she continuously interrogates, as she provocatively dissolves the subject-object binaries, allowing the pictured object to step out and merge with the viewing subject, and the latter to step in and become the picture itself. I'd like to, by in the end, like to look at the specific effects of these remakes in two cases, where Pushpamala chooses to inscribe herself into the artistic legacy of the two early figures of modern Indian art by performing the figures of the goddess Gaja Lakshmi from a Ravi Barma painting and Mother India, Bharat Mata, from an Abhinindranath Tagore painting. I'll begin with the first. In taking us back to the works of the two masters who set the paradigms of the new national art of modern India in the late 19th and early 20th century, we are also made to engage with two different orders of iconicities. With Ravi Varma, we have the instance of a modern artist who used all the accoutrements of academic illusionist oil painting to produce the period's most prestigious genre of Indian neoclassical paintings. His realist achievements of rendering lifelike India's gods, goddesses, epic characters, and mythological episodes would be sweepingly transported from the world of high art. Okay, so this is a very blurred image I'm realizing, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. So these are some of the images he did of, from classical scenes which hang in the Trivandrum Art Gallery. Looking at the next one, but this is a classic instance of a painting called Hamsa Damayanti and its passage into a pirated print, which happens in his own lifetime. So his work moves into that mass domain, and Ravi Verma quickly falls from grace as a modern Indian artist as his work comes to be appropriated more and more into popular iconography. Okay. Ravi Verma's move in 1893 of setting up his own oleography press in the outskirts of Bombay to launch the mass circulation of color prints of his oil paintings is seen as a foundational moment in the shaping of the popular religious iconographies of contemporary India. In retrospect, the act could also be seen, to quote Walter Benjamin, as a call to a far-reaching liquidation, an act that would end up dissolving the unique stature of the artist and his artwork. So in his famous essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, he talks about this far-reaching liquidation. The original Ravi Varma has ever since been lost in a mass of unregulated pirated copies. His painting of Gaja Lakshmi, a life-sized oil, is one that occupies a neither zone between a work of art and a gallery. It was commissioned and it remains on display in the Lakshmi Vilas Palace at Baroda, and the direct model for what would become a widely circulating calendar icon. Pushpamala's impersonation makes maximum capital out of Ravi Verma's working methods, his use of live models, picture sceneries, and dramatic performances to write her own self into the role of goddess against a painted backdrop, freezing herself in a similar static posture and frontal gaze, 
Like the original oil painting that would become a circulating God picture, the artist converts her own figure into a popular devotional icon. The effects of sub such impersonations are more unsettling when the target of remake is Abhinindranath's delicate wash painting of Bharat Mata. Okay. It's a faded painting uh, in, because Abhinindranath worked in the wash technique. So I, if the lights were off, it would be slightly more, but nonetheless, this is the original painting. With no direct reference to a known divinity, the figure of the saffron-clad motherland radiating a sacred and spiritual aura that belonged uniquely to the idea of art and nation defined Abhinindranath's painting of 1905. In creating this image in the heyday of the Swadeshi movement, Abhinindranath Tagore saw himself as fashioning a purely artistic icon for the nation. Unlike Ravi Varma's goddesses, Bharat Mata could in no way be collapsed into a popular print icon, neither in its own times nor ever since. The image retained its undiluted integrity as a work of art, standing apart from the many other iconographies of the motherland that circulated in the popular visual field. For instance, images like this, where wonderfully the mother is a map, but the mother carries the colors of the map, but also all the nationalist leaders are emerging around her. So this is what is circulating in the popular field, not Abhinindranath Bharat Mata. Abhinindranath, uh, the new Indian style which Abhinindranath had evolved was specifically intended to counter the powers of European academic art. But Pushpamala's remake of this painting does violence to the original in a number of ways. And I'm using the term violence deliberately, you know. It violates that sanctity, but she takes on the liberty to do so. Uh, it, it replaces the frail, ethereal form of Bharat Mata with the artist's own corporeal presence. It renders the misty, evanescent background of the painting into an artificial theater set. As with the Gajalakshmi piece with its large cut-out lotus in the foreground, in this picture, the artist plays around with the artifice of cardboard white lotuses and a stick-on halo. Most importantly, she surrounds the central image with its small repeating copies, forcing the original painting out of its secluded cocoon into a cycle of citations, reiterations, and duplications. In the context of this talk, the critical point to underline is the way an artist like Pushpamala can arrogate to herself these artistic licenses to trespass into the works of her predecessors and to undo their divine and sacred iconographies. Reflecting on a photographic series, a recent writer tells us how I quote, art itself is not at its most self-assured here, appearing, if anything, to be bedeviled by a crisis on several fronts, its materials, its modes, its place in the world. I would argue, on the contrary, that despite all the questioning of the means and ends of productions, modern art practice stands here in a position of supreme confidence and self-assurance. Its authority and its right to subvert a series of representational canons remain unchallenged. This is an authority and arrogance that Hussein had to forcibly let go, and which still remains a distant dream for the local Durga Puja artists of Calcutta. And it comes from Pushpamala's positioning within a secure, insulated space of avant-garde practice, from where her play acting and parodies can address a desired and initiated audience. Following in the trail of Ravi Varma or an M.F. Hussain, she too makes her select gestures to her, towards the popular. In one of her projects, for instance, she transfers her images from large photographs printed on metallic paper, such as this, to masses of postcard-sized prints which she adorns with cheap ornate frames and laid out at the floor level like a, sh like a small shop, and she called it her popular series. So these were laid out on the floor of exhibition galleries, but these postcard pictures attracted the kinds of buyers and art prices that of course makes a mockery of the popular icons they were intended to impersonate and their plebeian worlds of consumption. In keeping with the large body of contemporary art practice, the popular is effectively cited and appropriated, but also strategically kept outside the purview of these productions so that Pushpamala is neither tied to the criteria of popular appeal and sanction 
that determines the success of New Age Durga Puja art, nor pushed like Hussein to defend and justify her stances before a hostile and uninitiated public. Having crisscrossed several distinctions between high art and popular mythological and secular image genres, Pushpamala as a masquerading goddess, whether Lakshmi or Bharat Mata, remains firmly ensconced in the stature and immunities of a modern artistic icon. Thank you for your patience. We have to be in the short conversation, yeah, if you don't mind. Can I just turn on your mic? So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tapati, for such a rich um, paper and such a rich body of sort of case studies. Um, I really also want sort of want to thank you for the. Um, for the generosity of your time over the past three days, which you, I, you have sort of, sort of given me at least a bit of a context as to how um, you've developed your research, right? I mean, the various sort of like politics and the various kind of like discussions that actually went into how you have sort of shaped the kind of work that you do in, in Calcutta and your investment in Calcutta as a site and a space that is so generative of all these such rich body of cultural narratives. But I am particularly drawn, I think, uh, with your, this, this lecture particularly, um, about this image of the woman, you know, and her, her, the representation of the woman as a sort of like goddess kind of like figure, and of an artist like Pushpa, uh, uh, Pushpamala, sort of like, um, at times almost kind of like um, suspicion against this kind of like image, right? Uh, and I've read somewhere about how a lot of um, feminists in India were also in many ways suspicious of taking up the feminine as a sort of like date, the feminist, uh, uh, the, f the female deity as a sort of like iconic figure um, for various sort of like causes for the women. I was wondering why, why, why is that the case? Why is that sort of like this suspicion? Is it because of the sort of conflation between the female icon and the nation? Uh, 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 and if you could sort of like elaborate a bit on that. I'm not sure I have a clear answer, but obviously um, the female image uh, has been uh, one of the most valorized objects of what we may broadly call a male artistic domain, uh, and that hardly needs spelling out. Uh, and the fact is that yes, both as religious iconography, but also, as he said, as embodying the figure of the nation. Yes, uh, so one continuously has experimented with the female body as nude, as goddess, as motherland, and a series of things. Now, firstly, uh, the coming of age of women artists, and here, of course, women have worked with multiple forms of art practice, but the figure of the modern artist, trained modern artist, is something that is coming of age later than the figure of the male artist. So it's really in the immediately pre-war year, uh, interwar years, perhaps 1930s, 20s and 30s, that the first female artists are interestingly coming to Tagore's Shantiniketan more than to these other art schools. Yes, in the JG School of Art, you have Parsi women, early women, but you don't really hear very much of them ever becoming professional artists. So Tagore's Shantaniketan was seen to be this alternative space where, yes, lots of women artists did come. But there's also, I'm just going to tell you this brief thing because what I've also found interesting on how many, many women in that space was pushed into the craft domain whereas fine arts was something that male artists did. So Shantiniketan was a space which was meant to bring together art and craft traditions within a same institutional domain. But Nandalal Bose, one of the masters, first people who set up, his son becomes an artist, his daughters were both made to do craft. So it's quite interesting that, but 
What Shantaniketan produces is a domain of women's art, which was quite interesting, which was largely to do with the redesigning of a lot of craft practice and to produce crafts for modern living. But in that sense, the first generation of fiercely independent women artists who wanted to claim the domain came in the post-independence years. And they came really, so the first generations would have been trained in the 40s and the art schools. So it is with them that a new kind of interrogation, and I've been told by an artist who I trained with that how many of them wish to do away with the idea of bringing the professional model who would pose nude. And we know that, and that's been the, the center of a huge controversy which Valentin talked about. One of the films that is being denied in the film festival is a film called The Nude, which looks at the vocation of poor women who work for artist studios, who pose in the nude for hours for them, and often their families don't know that they do this work. So these women artists began to pose for each other. That was interesting. They said, we will not draw in the professional figure. And they began to, and that's of course an old tradition, uh, they began to paint themselves as fat, as middle-aged, as, you know, without doing away with the aesthetics of the other nude. So there are different ways in which I think the world of, uh, first there was this idea of women who were refusing to be slotted as women artists because we said we are artists and we don't want, it's like calling Hussein a Muslim artist or Nandalal Bose a Hindu artist. We were artists, we wished to claim the same space. But there were, Pushpamala and all come from a different generation. And for her, I think one of her prime concerns was to look at the question of the ways in which women have been imaged from photography to popular iconography, religious iconography, in cinema, in things. And I think one of the ways, and of course she's been continuously being compared with Cindy Sherman and that kind of project, but she sees that she's actually delving into a different history of image making in the Indian context and wishes to explore that. So yes, in some sense she is interrogating the ways in which the female image has been valorized, used, uh, by continuously inserting her own presence within that space. But I'm, I, so I think it is clearly an object of interrogation for her. And you, you um, I, I don't think you also sort of like, did you qualify um, as to whether the artisans who were building those pandals were primarily male artists or female artists and whether the whole sort of like art and craft kind of like distinction in Santinek can actually uh, inform how some of these artisans uh, the, 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 yeah. the, the, you know the work the of demographics of yeah. these artisans you know traditionally the mm -hmm. idol making the hereditary idol makers mm -hmm. and the, those who make the pandals have all been male yes okay. the pandal making is of course largely the agricultural people who do this work seasonally and they work with bamboo which is a hugely flexible medium and they make amazing scaffolding with it so it has been entirely artisanal work now women are beginning to sculpt idols, partly taking over their father's trades or their brothers for livelihood reason. And most of these were graduates from Santi Nikita? No, no I'm talking about the more traditional okay. artisanal, because right. when women come in is among the folk artists, so I showed you a Bastard village panel, they would bring folk women artists and get them to do. Now the figure of the Durga Puja designer, very interestingly, remained entirely male. It's only in the last two, three years that you have women artists who are also designing. So in every sense, yes, we are dealing with both artisanal and worlds of art production that remain largely male dominated. But women are there, they often, for instance, women do much of the details of the painting work of the image within these families. But these have, so in both artisanal spaces and art spaces, uh, of course, art spaces, women artists now command a very, very different position. But in many of these artisanal forms, women are bringing, are more and more participating in it. But there's certain kinds of folk and tribal art that are associated with primarily women's art. Mm. Um, but that's a whole, and many of the Durga Puja 
people have brought these women painters from, say, Madhubani in Bihar, or say from a Gond village, and got them to perform that work. So it wasn't. It's not a specific. It's not specifically sort of like licensed to sort of like a male artisan. Do you, or do you see that? Why? Why do you there think no there's this change? There are no licenses. It's just that traditionally, uh -huh. many traditionally of them been have been largely male artisanal work, mm. where women participate as part of household labor. Right. So let's put it. Many okay. of them are household cottage units where women do a lot of the background work of actually kneading the clay. Uh, you know, making the grinding paint when they were using natural paint. So women do a lot of the actual work within that household space. But the ultimate idol maker was a male figure mm. and remains that largely. Mm. Has anyone been to the Doga Puja? I was wondering. Uh, is it, uh, no one at all? Uh, it looks like a really sort of like spectacular festival, no? When does that happen? And the, when, when does the Durga Puja happen? Oh. It happens annually, right? Uh, the Durga Puja happens in autumn, uh, and the dates shift. So interestingly, the ritual calendar remains. So it's, uh, it's during Navratri, which is 10, years of, uh, 10 days of worship of the goddess. Uh, so it happens in late September, early mm -hmm. October. Uh, normally within, say, in a period between, say, the 25th of September till about 15th or 20th October. That's mm -hmm. the normal time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I must also say that uh, now each and every other form of puja is taking on the form of the Durga Puja. So we're living in a state where there's continuous festivity. Mm -hmm. So this form of lighting and decoration, but there's also been a, f a, a sharp fall in the artistry and creativity that I tracked because there's been a different kind of appropriation, state appropriation, in the name of a secular festival, mm -hmm. because uh, in the state I come from, we don't have a Hindu right-wing government. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but our chief minister uses this mode of the festival. She herself paints the eyes of the Durga, which again is a completely non-ritual thing. It's a priest mm -hmm. who does it. She's taken on this idea of bringing the goddess to life. She's become the prototype of Durga in, in politics, everything. But she also now, the festival has taken on new dimensions in the sense that there are many pujas that follow. Kali, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Vishwakarma. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them are taking on a bit of the scale of the same. But the Durga puja is the biggest event. And it's interesting how the year revolves around the pujas in Bengal. Yeah, I mean, time is marked by, you know, and families do still come together a for constant the constant list of festivities. Yeah, right. And I write that there's a year-round planning right. for it. The whole cultural economy, even commercial economy, largely revolves. It's a bit like Christmas in the Western world. It's it does revolve around this. It's nice to think of this alongside what uh, the claim that you have made earlier that um, it also this kinds of festivities doesn't actually foster a kind of criticism, right? As much as it's also trying to make a claim for a kind of artistic culture to have sort of like emerge. Um, but given the fact that they're also these are also sort of like very competitive sort of like forms of like yeah, displays. Could that sort of like, through the judging process, um, yeah. a, a, a kind of critical sort of like culture could have emerged from it? Or, mm. or does that not at all sort of like fa factor yeah. into how people... I think the know. judging process and awards mm -hmm. were deeply criticized by those who believed that you were entirely... And in some ways, say Asian paints, whose they were the first to introduce the awards in the 80s, and they wish to award the smaller creative production, which wasn't necessarily big budget, which didn't have political sponsorship, which wasn't dazzling with lights and replicas, but showed artistry and creativity. So in some ways, the awards began as a way of recognizing artistry and creativity, but now have been hijacked. And I think the awards have been the bane. Many of them say, many of the designers say that if we don't bring awards for the clubs, we don't get commissions for the next year. So in some sense, their artistic identity is almost held ransom to the awards they can bring in or the corporate funding they can attract. So all of this, in a way, clutters and queers the grounds on which the standing is art can survive. So in some sense, yes, it was meant to be an impetus to greater creativity, but it's also something that has now become about rival, deep rivalries mm. 
between neighborhood clubs. So over the, the decade and more that I studied it, I've seen a rise and fall of this. And many of the artists who really did excellent work no longer like to now work within the field. It's also interesting that they used the pujas to become artists. So many of them began their career by doing this work. So the figure of the subaltern artist therefore becomes very interesting. Many of them came from extremely poor backgrounds. They went through an art college degree, they did the work, they gained the recognition, and today they believe they become pure artists. And if they do the work, they'll be very selective, they do one or two. And they don't like the interference of the clubs, of awards, so they wish to now withdraw. But many, many others have now treated this as livelihood. This is the time when they can do five or six, and they say we earn enough to sustain ourselves as artists the year around. A lot of art college students do this work now as part of their training. So it's an interesting way in which the art world is, uh, is getting now directly involved. Right. But, uh, but the figure of the artist finds it hard to survive here. And that's an uh, argument I make. But many of them have become artists. Mm. I want to sort of like open the conversation to the floor. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. Oh, let me come over. Oh, you have a mic. Thank you. Hi, uh, Professor Tabati. I'm just getting back to Hussein. Uh, when you spoke, uh, when I look at the series, the whole goddess series, uh, there are many which are just uh, nude uh, paintings, similar to other artists. But then there are some in which he's juxtaposed the Indian goddess, the Hindu goddess, with a Muslim clothes figure. And uh, how would you define that? That's been a constant uh, challenge or a constant objection that was brought against Hussein, that um, he doesn't paint the figure of the Muslim woman nude. In fact, he, the Muslim women hardly figures in his art. I think he's done one or two, one of Fatima, uh, some of his stepmother, uh, others. So this idea of, but you know, Hussein said something very interesting to this. He painted, uh, the goddess with the animal figure very often in sexual interaction. And that again is part of a lot of traditional religious iconography. So she would show Sita nude on the tail of a Hanuman being rescued. Now the interesting thing here of course, and Hussein always said it, an artist said it, that why is nudity a form of disrespect, right? So that itself was an equation that both art historians and artists were struggling to break. As we know, the nude is such a canonized figure, such a canonized object, right? So when does nudity or the painting somebody nude become an object of, when does it become an act of disrespect, right? So when series of artists have painted nudes, was it as a disrespect, so say from Series. So this became a very interesting argument about the argument, when is the nude obscene and when is the nude a work of art? Uh, when does nudity become an accepted form within art practice? And when does it become, when does it come to be seen as something that is intended? So here, as we know, artistic intention is so hard to prove. So here were a group who was determined to say that by painting Draupadi partly disrobed, and we know that in the game of dice she was partly disrobed, by painting a series of goddesses, nude, semi-nude, he was, and the term that was used was a very dangerous term. He said it's an act that's tantamount to the rape of Hindu goddesses. So this was a sexualized charge being brought to an artist. Now you could bring this charge to any artist, right? To say that when you're painting a sexualized female figure, are you going to then say, and yes, you can bring this charge. I mean, people have brought this charge against Picasso saying that he used his brush like a penis, right? There's a huge sexualized charge 
to every image of a woman he's painted, right? So then what was Hussein's offense in particular, right? So when you're saying that, yes, uh, the Muslim women are painted clothed, but then he said that I did not have such a rich body of iconography in Islam to draw on, right? In fact, he said that when, as he was growing up, he said he grew up in a very world charged with visual images, even though he grew up as a pious Muslim. He said he would paint taziyas during Muharram. But he said that as emerging as a modern artist, and he, he began as a uh, painter of cinema hoardings. So Hussein comes from working class background, comes to Bombay, earns a livelihood painting hoardings, and is then gradually by a patron sent to art schools. He said that Indian, traditional Indian sculpture and traditional or Hindu mytho mythology and iconography provided him with a large cultural field of resources that he wished to draw on. So I'm here giving both Hussein's own explanation, where he continuously said, I had no intention to disrespect goddesses. I have done this out of my deep regard for Hindu culture, which I feel I've absorbed as my own, right? So that was always Hussein's own defense. He was not really, and in fact, Hussein was not a very transgressive artist at all. And Hussein even publicly apologized. That was the amazing thing. He was made to apologize, but it cut no ice. So the, why should an artist have to apologize for his art? That is, of course, a big question here that everybody will have to say that must artists ever apologize for what they do? So all of these came into the issue. So this idea that he painted a few Muslim women, and they were mostly actual figures from his family. But there's one image of Fatima he painted. But there isn't a large body of Islamic iconography which he felt he could draw. So my uh, question remains that uh, because it involves a religious theme, by avoiding any Islamic figures, would he have absolved himself to say of uh, this allegation of uh, working to against the religion? So if he had just painted, say, the Hindu goddesses on their own, like in the Draupadi, and not included any figures from Islam at all, would that have helped his case? Actually, you know, the later Islamic iconography comes in later. When he's in Qatar, the Qatar Museum commissions a series. But I, there isn't any series on Islamic, on the history of Islam that Hussein does. Right, you know, and Hussein is a great, as he said, uh, he would do these vast series, and he would call them from Mohenjo Daro to Manmohan Singh. You know, this is typically Hussein, you know, the tongue in cheek. He would say from Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi, you know. So this was his series on Indian civilizations he would do. So I, not in his entire career has Hussein ever turned to painting a series that would be devoted specifically to a history of Islam. Even after he, he's seen to be taken up within Qatar, he's commanded. So I don't have a ready answer to that, but to say that that's why uh, I'm deeply dis uncomfortable, as Hussein would have been, of calling himself a Muslim artist. He was just like many artists today will not say I'm a Hindu artist. I'm an artist, OK? And in India, we are a multi-religious community. And I don't wear my Hinduness on my sleeve. So I feel that, I mean, when I write, I should have claim on all the religions I, can, I should be able to speak on. Sorry. Oh. That question, that question, what you just said there, this is something that, that strikes at the hearts of Malaysians because we're, we tend to be very aware of religious differences. Um, and so I was just wondering, and I don't know a lot about this case, would it, do you think, in your opinion, would it have made any difference, or were there other people who were not Muslims, who were not Islam, that would it have made any difference if he had been a Hindu doing this? Did it, did it make any difference to the case? I mean, and that, that's a question coming from a place where I think sure, it would absolutely. make a difference. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what I said, that uh, I showed you a large number of works of Hindu artists, K.G. Subramaniam, who's continuously playing with the idea of Durga as a folk goddess in a series of local performances, 
Gogi Saroj Pal, who's showing. So they are goddesses, who are, um, they are artists who are not Muslims. I think that's why I've said it's, Hussein's Muslimness becomes an issue, right? Absolutely. And there's a series of political battles that were involved on why Hussein becomes the target. But his Muslimness becomes very ready to use against him, of course, yes. So that is when everything that he paints is put down to the religion he holds. And he's seen to be an anti-Hindu painter. And that becomes quite paradoxical to an artist who always believed that the entire inheritance of Indian iconographies was his as an Indian. Right? So, Yes, he comes to be labeled and slotted as a Muslim painter, both by this anti Hussein kind of, uh, kind of propaganda, but even by those who came to his cause. As I said, the only gallery named after him was the Jamia Millia Islamia, which is a Muslim, like Aligarh Muslim University, a Muslim university, but set up within the framework of. It's not a theological university. These are modern universities, but set up under the cause of what we call nationalist Islam, where there were many Muslim leaders who were important nationalists. So secular Islam. And when we released our book on Hussein Barefoot Across the Nation, it's in this gallery that it was considered safe to do so. So again, it's interesting that there are spaces that have quite out of accident become safe habitus a Muslim country, a gallery, but it was never that intention, though it would have been. Can I have the next question from Shiraz? <coughs> Sorry, I was going to ask, um, yeah. I was going to ask a question that is related to the previous question, uh, but maybe now that you've answered it, you can broaden it a bit, which is, if this, if the, the rise of Hindu extremists, uh, you know, started by attacking various individuals like MF Hussein, it's kind of uh, attempted a kind of collective tutorial for the nation. You, know, you cannot mess with us as well. Um, the, the question of secularism and the privileges, you use the word privilege, which is very interesting. How do we understand where India is today uh, in terms of pushback on Hindu extremism um, and the the protection of those second privileges, which we also assert, uh, we also associate with things like intellectual freedom sure. and artistic freedom, because that's clearly under attack by Hindu extremists. I think it's a hugely shrinking space of that freedom, or if freedom is a difficult word, then one may say some kind of autonomy and immunity, and that's why I use the term more than freedom of practice. And we've seen it now affecting films in a huge way. Uh, forget about films which don't even make um, it to the thing, but we know that a ridiculous battle is being fought over a historical legend involving a Muslim emperor and a Rajput queen and a fictional romance. And today, the Rajput community feels so threatened that Padmavati cannot be screened. So I think, and this is not even art, it's popular commercial cinema. I think we're dealing with very, very, and I think since the 90s into now, that space, and as academics, we feel our autonomy is deeply now contested. Now, that is where, interestingly, uh, all of us retreat into worlds where we feel we are talking to a like-minded group, right? And that's why many of us, I mean, my Durga Puja, I've presented work in times, and I've had people saying that by focusing only on all this festivity and this carnivalous quality and on advertisement and all, I write in my book that I'm writing a non-religious history of the Durga Puja, and I say it by, by recognizing the fact that there is an affective emotive content around Durga, but Durga is much more than a, which is why we can play with advertisements. We can do so many things with Durga. Durga is malleable to so many uses. She's one of us, right? So every modern woman can see herself as a Durga. There was a recent controversy about showing Durga coming to a 
hairdressing saloon owned by a Muslim <laughs> called Javed Habib. So most of us said, what's wrong, you know? I mean, if every modern woman can become a Durga, Durga is entitled to her own bit of fashion treatment and all. So, you know, there's a way in which there's an everyday affective irreverence with which Durga has been a part of it, right? But I've had people attacking me saying that you have denigrated her religiosity, right? So that is a, as I said, so none of us are completely uh, today protected from those attacks. It's intruded. So it's interesting. It's not just the artist or the writer. It's academics. Everywhere, I think, there are trolls. We know that social, social media, the cyberspace was used against Hussein in, in an amazing way. This was pre-Facebook days. And now we know that this social media has often become a very vicious place in which attacks are done. And where the attacker remains unknown, right? So all of that becomes difficult. So if you ask me a simple question, I said we are dealing with an increasingly endangered space of academic, artistic, literary uh, space in which uh, this kind of more plural, multi-religious, diverse, kind of opinions can flourish, right? And uh, so, yes, uh, it is a threatened space that, and I think the Hussein case becomes instructive, like the Salman Rushdie affair. We must remember that India was the first to ban the satanic verses. Uh, as a secular nation, and it's always said it is appeasing the Muslim, and that was always said that why is it that whenever something is offensive to Islam, the Indian state immediately is out there to protect. It's a minority thing, right? You protect a minority sentiment, and that was Rajiv Gandhi's position. But why is it that when it comes to Hindus, it's taken for granted that you can take? And this is precisely the arguments that have been used. But I'm just saying the culture of ban and censorship, these were landmark, satanic verses and MFSN's case. And now it's become rampant. You know, this is getting censored, this is getting banned, this cannot be in the public domain. And everybody's in search of alternative spaces in which this can be done. Yes, please. Next, next question, please. Yeah. Uh, Eugene, yeah. please. Um, thank you, Professor, uh, for the enlightening talk. Um, I'm a student at the University of Malaya. And um, I actually have two questions, but one has been answered previously, which is my assumption of the fact that the attacks against uh, M.F. Hussein was probably um, could be due to his religion instead of um, nudity, which I think was used as a facade against him. Um, my question revolves around um, what has such events um, against um, M.F. Hussein, such hostile attacks against his work and his art, um, done to inst artistic in institutions in India, for example, the galleries and art colleges, are there spaces where they are more conscientious about the background, ethnicity, and religion of their students or the works of artists that they take on? Uh, see, um, There was an instance where the attack of, on Hussein and one didn't want to conflate the two because Hussein occupied a space of privilege that many other younger artists don't. But there was a case in Baroda where a young artist, art student's work was taken down, vandalized, because again he played around with uh, religious iconographies. So. But you know, this idea on whether you test students' religious backgrounds and all, I would say not. The art colleges and these places uh, remain open to different kinds of artists and now different castes. You have people not from upper caste, but from different caste backgrounds, more artisanal caste backgrounds emerging. So in some sp sense, we're dealing with a much more democratized world and I've said, Part of the problem of publics is that more and more students are coming into art colleges from diverse social and class backgrounds. Uh, there are great, larger and larger now spaces and livelihoods that are offering themselves open. 
So there's been a democratization, perhaps, of the worlds of art and artistic practice, but there's also a more exclusive core of who actually becomes part of a more national and international art scene. And we know that, therefore, there are you know, art worlds and art worlds. And we normally, when we refer to worlds of contemporary art, we refer to worlds that have come into attention, and that's where the figure of curator, the critic, the gallery, the catalog all become important. But the point is, it is a largely democratized world where lots and lots of people are coming, even from backgrounds like idol making and becoming artists, right? Now, what does becoming artists mean? There are livelihoods, but they may not always become what they call gallery artists. That is not a space that is often aware. And in those spaces, when you're doing television, set design, film set design, outdoor publicity, it really doesn't matter what religion you're coming from or what caste. It's a space for livelihood and production. And now, yes, a lot of artists did feel it's better not to play with religious iconographies. Yes, it did create a degree of caution. For an older generation, I've said that painting gods and goddesses was, has been an integral part of modern Indian art. And that art has been secular, but it never stopped it from drawing on a large body of religious iconography. So from Abhinandranath to go into the present, artists continue to play. But yes, there was also a way in which how much license you can take with iconographies did become an issue. And I do say, yes, there was they become areas of caution. Um, and that's why the Durga Puja to me is very fascinating, that here people have experimented with the form of the goddess, but nothing that has been genuinely transgressive has ever been done, right? You do a lot of experiments, so you can enlarge Durga's head. It looks like a Ravinda Reddy sculpture, maybe. And you can make her the other, the children who accompany her into a little tiny pedestal. So there's a lot of experimentation with the iconography of Durga, but none that has actually been seen to be that has completely upturned, so come into attack. So that is again interesting. I've seen the way Durga is used in, in advertising of all kinds. And there's been never any culture of, so what I say, that culture of offense making and offense taking has thankfully remained outside the sphere of Durga Pujas. And we don't want to drag in the Javed Habib controversy of why Durga came to a, the Javed Habib salon was a North Indian attack. And in Bengal, we said, sure, she has every right to do so. Okay. so. It's an interesting idea because we've been discussing that surely some of us should have the right not to feel offended too, right? The too many people are always claiming to feel offended. So I think Durga Puja has circulated in that space where that politics of offense taking and offense making has not entered so far. I'm only saying so far. And that makes it that open space. But it's also interesting that artists are aware that they're sculpting an image of Durga. So you can take liberty, even if you know that there are, that image will not be worshipped. You may often have a smaller image. You take liberties within certain bounds. But the work of modern art does not, does not have to keep within those bounds. So I mean, I have, so what these boundaries are, I think, are something which are being tested in, every, in different spaces and sites. Okay, great. Uh, we're running out of time, so maybe uh, can I get one or one more question, or if there's a second question, we can take it together. Any last question? No. Really? Okay. If yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, can you pass the mic? Yeah, apart from Salman Rushdie's uh, uh, book, Big Ban, in the government actually taking an uh, active role in banning it, all the others didn't involve the government. It was civil society, it was members of the public, really. So there was no, was there an active uh, government actively discouraging it, say, for instance, with Emma Hussein's case, or in this recent case with the film, for instance, a BJP MP is actually 
advocating an assassination, giving uh, uh, money, to, and yet has the government taken any steps to kind of stop that kind of obviously? The answer is no. And that's why, in a way, you cannot actually say the government has banned it. Rajiv Gandhi banned the book feeling that this would incite communal violence. In the same way, very shamefully, uh, when Muslim fundamentalists attacked the Bangladeshi writer Taslima Nasreen, uh, India had given her exile. It, she wanted to live in Bengal. And again, for fear of inciting it, she was not given asylum. So that's an interesting case where I think we've strongly failed that idea of being able to protect a writer who wanted to be in Bengal. She saw herself as Bengali. But there was a, a kind of demonstration against her work in Hyderabad where she was forced to take down. So it's interesting how the writer, a Bangladeshi writer, or Salman who, Rushdie, who we know that because of Ayatollah's thing against him, lived in hiding, played. Now, what is the government's role is an interesting point. Now, while the government, as I said, the Supreme Court actually acquitted him of the charges, right? Now, why is it that Hussein could not return? It's because one, in, in Bombay, where he lived, you still had the Shiv Sena uh, uh, right wing, which vandalized his property, and his family actually said that there's too much risk to him. So the government would not give him the protection he needed. In the same way that Salman Rushdie was invited to the Jaipur Literary Festival, and then for security reasons, he was told not to come, because they said we cannot ensure security. So what becomes interesting is it's the life which comes under threat. They will say, if you can come, but if we cannot provide you with the adequate security, then we are culpable, right? So it becomes a very interesting cyclical argument where the government is failing to provide what it legitimately should, right? But always claiming that if there is a public outrage, then we will not be able to control it, right? So here again, the government is a shadow player then here, always. So either if the government is not actively taking a part in banning, nor is the government directly coming out to against those you know, who are carrying out the bans and outrages. It's in a way the government has not come out against public lynchings you know, in the country yeah. too. So it's a shadow player, I would say there. Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, please join me in thanking Professor Tapati for the really wonderful lecture. Um, and this concludes our third um, public lecture series for this year. Um, to find out more about uh, our public lecture series, please follow Ilham Gallery or Visual Art Gallery, uh, Visual Art Program, University of Malaya sort of like Facebook page. And we will have our, we will resume next year with our next sort of like public lecture series in March 2018. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>